What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And today, some of our guests, including the host, we all have a bit of an Alec Murdoch hangover uh, trying to get here, crawl to the finish line. Um, of course, as you all know by now, Alec Murdoch went from successful lawyer to now a convicted killer, shooting his wife Maggie and son Paul at the family's Carlton County property back in June of 2021. A jury of his peers took less than three hours to come back with a guilty verdict. And that, my friends, is just a fraction of the story. Best guests and a first time face on our show. Lori Murray has an office in Columbia, South Carolina that bears her name. She's an aggressive litigator and negotiator whose focus is on criminal defense and personal injury matters. She's a former law clerk and also a former prosecutor, uh, the National Trial Lawyers Top 100 uh, Trial Lawyers, and voted elite attorney in 2020 by her peers in both personal injury and criminal law. The Sheely twins are back. Brian with the beard. Worked for five years at the Richland County, South Carolina Public Defender's Office before establishing the Sheely Law Firm. Brian has spent the majority of his legal career defending the most violent charges, including clients charged with murder, armed robbery, rape, and burglary. Luke Sheely, without the beard, also a native of South Carolina, began his career as a public defender before switching to criminal defense. Luke has trained in the Colorado method of capital voir dire at the Colorado School of Law and also in death penalty defense at the Santa Clara University School of Law. In 2013, Luke was appointed to his first death penalty case. And Dr. Christina Marinakis has over 20 years of jury research, uh, study, and applied practice in law and psychology. And while her home is in Los Angeles, she's in the courtroom nearly every week, assisting with jury selections and trial st strategy in cases throughout the great land of ours. A quick reminder, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Insta. On Twitter, we are at Podcast STS. Please uh, subscribe on YouTube. Like us on YouTube at some point during this. And if you'd like to, you can support us on Patreon as well. So obviously, as we all know by now, Judge Newman, Clifton Newman, uh, the GOAT of all judges, greatest of all time, imposed two sentences of life in prison to be served consecutively for the murders found guilty in under three hours. Uh, Lori, you are a first timer on the show. Uh, I know you've been doing a lot of television. Your reaction that this came back in the short amount of time that it did uh, come back? Well, I did not expect it to come back this early. And then John Metter stood up. And so it, everything was kind of a toss up at that point. Once John Metter stood up, everything was out the window because it just was something that we had not seen before. I'm still a little bit surprised. You know, when you get a quick verdict that it's going to be a guilty verdict, but three hours on a case that was six weeks long, six weeks long is uh, that's pretty damn fast. And uh, to the Sheely twins, Brian, to you first. Um, and we'll work our way around the horn here. Um, under three hours, this trial was almost uh, six weeks in length. Um, a lot of people were saying it was going to be a hung jury. How surprised were you? Oh, <clears throat> I wasn't surprised, but I, you know, it's one of those things that as soon as it, what I was always saying is if it comes back that night, he's, he's going down hard. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's one of those situations where they're so overwhelmed by the evidence, the lies, the financial crimes um, that, you know, it's, they didn't possibly review all the evidence again, anything like that. They, they held their hands up. They figured out who was for and who was against, and then they, they beat down the other side and it happened pretty quickly. So um, not surprising given the, the way the case shaped up, but certainly not good for Alex Murdoch. Luke. I agree. Um, I think they're exhausted. They're looking to get, get out of there. And when you have so much bad character evidence of just, he's a liar, he's a thief. Sure, there's other courtrooms for those charges, but when it comes into the murder trial, I think it, it has to influence the jury. I mean, the prosecution called it motive. I don't think it really 
ever really panned out his motive. You could tell by the way they used it to just say he's a liar. Therefore, when he testifies, you can't believe him. I think if you imagine a, a trial without any of that stuff um, and you're just dealing with this particular case, um, maybe they would have deliberated for a lot longer. Um, but it is what it is. And that's what appeals are for. And a lot of people are very satisfied with this verdict. And I know Judge Newman uh, had a lot to say about it. And so we can talk about that. But it, it, we, I agree with Brian. If it came back that evening, he was going down. And uh, uh, back back uh, over to Lori, um, since uh, Luke brought it up about the appeals process, Dick Harpootley went on the record and said that he is going to appeal this in 10 days. Uh, can you just walk us through that process and uh, if you think, in fact, there's any chance uh, of this appeals process playing out in Alex's favor? Well, the reason he said 10 days is because yeah, under South Carolina rules, you have to request, you have to file a notice of appeal within 10 days. And then you, I don't know the other timelines, honestly, because I don't do appellate work. I give it to somebody else. I don't ever want to have to sit there and read a six week long transcript. That would make me want to shoot myself. Um, but you know, there were some appealable issues. This 403 evidence coming in, the the bad character evidence, that's a very decent appealable issue. Uh, whether they will win that issue is another question. There were some uh, object objections that they made during the trial that they will appeal. There's probably harmless error in a lot of those, meaning that they wouldn't change the outcome. So the Court of Appeals won't really rule on those. But uh there were some objections that he missed too. Honestly, with the juror being dismissed, I would have objected and made a mistrial on that. And he did not. Dick completely stood up and said, I don't take exception with your ruling. I, I think you just have to object to everything. Throw it all out there. Judge Newman was denying every one of their motions anyway. So why not just keep objecting? It just um, to preserve the entire record. That was my way. Yeah. Dr. Maranakis, to you, uh, you're a person who studies jurors for a living. Uh, you study human behavior. Um, it didn't take long for one juror to already come out and speak to the media. Judge Newman uh, made it clear that if anyone harassed jurors, that they would uh, feel his wrath. But it appears that on his own volition, a juror named Craig Moyer has talked to ABC News. And he said, uh, and this is uh, probably the, the quote of the entire interview here. I didn't see any true remorse, any compassion, he told ABC News. Alec Murdoch never cried. All he did was blow snot. Um, Dr. Maranakis, to you, uh, it appears the jury had their mind made up before they uh, even walked into that jury deliberation room. I'm sure several of them have. Anytime you come back with a quick verdict like that, and I'm sure uh, the brothers here would tell you that's not a good sign uh, for the defendants. And usually when you have any type of hope of getting an acquittal, or even a hung jury, it's a longer deliberations and the jurors are gonna at least walk through the evidence. One of the issues here is in South Carolina, they can't take notes. The jurors can't take notes during the trial. And so there's not a whole lot to really actually look at uh, when it comes to time in terms of evidence and going over things, they can go over their memory, they can talk to their blue in the face, but it's whatever they're remembering that what stuck out in their minds is what they're gonna be talking about. So I'm sure some of those jurors came in right away with their opinions and maybe there was a couple people that were on the fence, but those people didn't have a whole lot to argue other than arguing some potential reasonable doubt. There wasn't a lot of evidence. There was no other person that could have done this. There was no real other piece of evidence that someone could hang their hat on is to, to acquit. And so anybody that would have been in his favor or had those doubts would have given in pretty quickly. And STS Nation, we are coming to you now with reading some of your comments. I'll try to get as many in as possible. Kimberly's Cabin, Iowa. Sounds like a bed and breakfast. Simply amazed that justice was finally served in this country. Good wishes to the judge, jury, prosecution team, and court personnel. That is what makes America, America. Um, I think the process played out. Uh, that is my own personal opinion. Howling Waters writes, the Supreme Court, the South Carolina Supremes will not grant a new trial, and we are a global show. Greetings from Finland. Uh, during our earlier show today, we had Finland, Scotland, we had uh, Australia, Cape Town, South Africa, all represented. Uh, Deidre writes, what time is this supposed to start? It's happening right now. You are right on time. You are right on time. Um, 
to Brian Healy, one of the two twins. It's redundant to say two twins, by the way. There was no victim impact statement. Uh, what did you make of that? And uh, and then I'll have your brother follow up by explaining what a, a victim impact statement really is and, uh, you know, the, the legality behind it, why we didn't hear one today. But let's start with you. I don't think there's any victim statements today because it's such a, I mean, this was a family murder. And so, I mean, everyone's upset. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, Buster's a, a statutory victim. Um, John Marvin's a statutory victim. Maggie's sister's a statutory victim. And these are people that have put themselves out there. So number one, it, you know, it's not a traditional victim impact presentation that Judge Newman is accustomed to where it's a, you know, a, a, a fight gone wrong, a robbery murder, where there's a, a slew of angry victim family members that are asking for what Creighton Waters asked for today. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that this is um, a family that has been in the media for years now. Well, before before this incident, but certainly now. And, you know, so on the victim side of it, yeah, there's justice for Maggie and Paul. If those family members of Maggie's especially believe this verdict is a just and true outcome. And then, of course, um, we know, you know, who in um, Murdoch's camp in terms of Buster and John Marvin, they would have been vocally, you know, a advocating for something less. But, you know, sometimes there's just a, not a good moment to really react to that. You know, I think, and, you know, traditionally uh, the defense team, the lawyers will get up along with a grandmother or family members, whoever that's close, near and dear, and they'll make a kind of impassioned plea to the court for the, the minimum sentence. So in this case, it would have been 30 years, uh, murder 30 to life in South Carolina. You didn't see that. Um, it's that, and, and Lori probably knows and, and can speak to this as well. Losing a, a big trial, a big like we had a double murder in front of judge newman in december where we, where we won one of the murders and lost the other and so we had to get up there and do the hard thing after such a long and exhausting process and it's the hardest thing a lawyer has to do is get up there and beg for mercy after contesting the charges against him or her and 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 you know you're never happy with the judge necessarily at the end of a guilty verdict. You may respect the judge, but you're still in the fight. You know, you're in the fight. And so that's just really hard to do. I'll turn it over to Luke. I've, I've talked plenty. No, it's great. Uh, Luke, you want to add to that? Uh, particularly, I'm wondering about uh, Maggie's sister. Um, I thought maybe we would hear from her because she didn't seem too pleased with Alec Murdoch when she took the stand, but not a word. Uh, your thoughts? I just think the family is torn. Clearly you have probably Maggie's sister and her parents who are certainly on the prosecution camp. And then you've got poor Buster and, and John Marvin sitting on the other side. So I think partly you don't want any more, maybe public statements that can be micro scrutinized. But on the other hand, you're, you know, I imagine Buster, I don't know the details, but would hope they would will hope to have some kind of relationship with him. So if they get up there and really nail, put the nail in the coffin publicly, then maybe they never would. So maybe that has something to do with it. But for the defense side, not putting up anything and the lawyers not even speaking, that was really I have never seen that. I mean, you've been advocating for a man for almost six weeks and then you can't ask the judge for 30 years and give him a good reason why. A good reason why is Buster. And, you know, I would have Buster talk as hard as it could be and say, look, please, sir, my, I lost my mom and my brother and I would like to have a relationship with my dad. And it will be a better relationship with my dad if he has some hope. He'll be a better father from prison. So give him, you know, 40 instead of two consecutive life. So I don't know why nothing was said. And then you would have a press conference after the fact, but not say anything to the judge about sentencing. Never seen that in my life. So. And Joel, just if I can chime in real quick, I mean, there's you heard Judge Newman say, you know, Mr. Murdoch, you know, what do you have to tell me? You know, he said what he said, of course. Um, and, and Judge Newman said, you know, I've I've never had anybody, you know, after a trial admit that they were what they did, actually. Well, that's of course. Um, but, you know, that's not the time for Alec Murdoch to start talking for once. And he, he, he pretty much remained silent because. 
it's all, you know, it's all uh, under oath. It's recorded, it's transcribed. So he's, he's going to say nothing there in that colloquy with Judge Newman that would hurt his chances at an appeal. So that's pretty typical. And, you know, if the nation's wondering, why didn't he talk to Judge Newman very much? Well, that's why. I'm wondering if uh, Buster's silence, you know, speaks volumes. Some people um, speculated that at some point during this trial, he realized maybe that his father did commit these crimes. I don't know. Maybe he didn't want anything to do with him in the end, but uh, that's that's pure speculation. I do not know. I want to get to this comment from uh, Joringo or Haringo. I lit up a candle for victims. It's a sad case in a long six weeks. Watched every minute of it. Of it. Reminds me a lot of the chandler halderson case without the prestige um this was grueling dr maranakis um for everyone I mean, for judge newman for the state for the defense um everyone involved particularly for the jurors um how tough is it for jurors to to expend so much physically and emotionally and then have to make a decision that really impacts a person's and not just one person the entire family's life um, in this case, literally for life. Yeah, um, having been on the side of the prosecution in a case uh, for murder, uh, it never feels good, no matter what happens, whether you win the case or lose the case, nobody wins in these cases. And it doesn't feel good to send someone to prison for the rest of their life. It doesn't surprise me that there wasn't any victim impact statements uh, because you don't wanna have a role in sending someone to prison for the rest of their life that outright. You know, you just let the, let the judge do what he's gonna do and you don't want to have that. But for these jurors, they didn't ask for this. They didn't, you know, they didn't bring this on. They did their duty. Um, they served their, their country, their state and serving on that jury. But man, it takes a toll. And I've talked to jurors after cases like this. They say it's like going through war together. They have a bond amongst each other because they've all been through something so intense that no one will ever understand what it was like to do that experience. And oftentimes the jurors will stay friends or meet up every year in anniversaries because it is like a brotherhood that they served on that jury together uh, because of how, how hard it is to go through something like that and make a decision that weighty. Um, Lori, to you, um, this comment here from John Shepard, justice has prevailed. Now we need justice for Stephen Smith. There are a lot of dead bodies that piled up around this family. Um, we've had Steve Peterson on as recently as last night. He is the private investigator at one point, the, um, longest serving DEA agent in the world, but he is doing some PI work for Stephen Smith's family. Uh, what does happen to all these other cases, including the financial crimes, uh, the case of Stephen Smith, Mallory Beach? Walk us through the legal process moving forward, because this story is not really done quite yet. No, well, let's first start with the financial crimes. Uh, Alec Murdoch, got on the stand and admitted every one of those financial crimes. So that, to, and Judge Newman during sentencing said, we're going to deal with those swiftly. So he wants Alec Murdoch off of his table because he is the judge on those cases as well. But that's a plea deal. And anything on top of what he is looking at now is just to satisfy the victims in that case. And I don't know how you make a plea deal when you've got so many victims because Everyone wants their case to be the one that he's convicted of, but it does have to be a plea deal. It can't be a trial. He's admitted everything. Uh, so that's the first one. Stephen Smith, that is a, that's going to be a tough case. And they, they reopened all of the cases that surrounded this family or, you know, well, the other two, Gloria Satterfield and um, Stephen Smith. And it's just going to be really difficult to prove. They said they were making headway was the rumor that I heard. And I also heard that it wasn't pointing to the Murdochs, but I don't know that to be true. Uh, but they are actively investigating. And two people in my social media were asking me about, hey, well, what about Stephen Smith in the middle of this case? I'm like, you got to get through one. They can't multitask. They cannot focus any energy on Stephen Smith right now. I mean, they're maybe a little bit, but mainly they're trying to get through this murder case and then they'll look at Stephen Smith. So I think that that's definitely going to be looked at. I don't, you know, Eric Bland was the family attorney for Gloria Satterfield and he has gotten on every media outlet he can and says that he does not believe there was foul play. And if her own attorney doesn't believe there was foul play, then we got to give him that there probably wasn't foul play in that. Uh, with regard to the Mallory Beach case, uh, that case died when Paul died. So the civil, the civil suit will still be proceeding. Maggie's estate, I think, has settled out of that, but the civil suit is still there and but all the other criminal cases, the only one we have left really is probably Stephen Smith's. 
and really do hope that they find justice for that kid because that was a bad case. And I don't want to implicate anyone, but uh, we all know uh, there's been a lot of uh, innuendo and chatter that uh, Buster may have had some involvement in that. And that is something that Steve Peterson has talked about openly when he's doing this private investigating. Um, I mean, what a, a crazy situation that would be if uh, the focus of the investigation turned that way. Um, I did hear that it was, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I did hear that it was not focusing that way, but <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Murdoch name was mentioned so many times. The, the problem is that Stephen Smith alluded to this relationship that he was having and he mentioned an affluent family and he, he you know, everybody just assumed that it was the Murdochs because the Murdochs take care of things and get away with things. But apparently there was, you know, a car full of boys riding around that were like I used to do in my little small town. You know, that's what we did. We rode around, we took, grabbed a couple of beers and rode around and drank. And that's probably what they were doing. And that he got, he ran out of gas and called for help. And that's what ended up happening to him. But that's going to be an extremely difficult case to prove. And if it was Buster, then who that is one family that, <laughs> that uh, needed to be removed from society. Yeah. I don't think anyone uh, could handle reliving that except with Buster this time around. So let's hope that's not the case. Angela Gallagher writes, I wish they would have gone for the death penalty too. I wish I had a death penalty. Oh wait, I do. I have a death penalty expert on this panel. Luke, um, why didn't they uh, pursue the death penalty here? And in retrospect, in hindsight, Monday morning quarterbacking, should they have or Friday afternoon quarterbacking? Well, they didn't go for it because in South Carolina and most places, I mean, death penalty is bifurcated. You first, you have a normal trial and murder like this is statutorily eligible because of two bodies. Um, and then you, if you convict, then you go on to entire sentencing phase. And really, in order to get a death verdict, you, you know, all those jurors have to unanimously, unanimously agree in South Carolina but there's no good reason to spare his life. And essentially, if you can get one juror to find mitigation, any anything that he's worth stating, whether that's the way the way it would affect Buster or any other loved ones. I mean, it's it's very hard. And if your case was kind of circumstantial in the first place, then you end up having residual doubt play into it. Jurors go, well, I don't want to I don't know if I can give him death because, you know, this was kind of wishy washy. You know, we've got him, but I don't know if we should kill him. And it just it also brings a tremendous amount of um, a totally different jury selection game that would have individual sequestered voir dire where you've got jurors heavily researched and questioned individually, which is the only time we get to do that in South Carolina. In South Carolina, you know, our, our typical voir dire for non-death is just really I'm sure there are some questionnaires in this case, but it's really it's like reading tea leaves. What do you do? What is what does your husband or wife do? What are your bumper stickers? So it's really terrible but um so i think it's partially also i mean I, I would just say it they usually give the death penalty to poor black people in south carolina it's a very politically motivated thing and as much as the powers that be were happy to publicly go after him and and rid you know our state of uh, a corrupt lawyer they were not going to seek death on a rich white guy in a circumstantial case they just weren't um so it never was it never was on the cards. It never would be, even though he's he has the statutory eligibility, which is two bodies in this case. But, you know, it doesn't always happen. It's also a tremendous amount of manpower and resources. And clearly they spared no expense with the prosecution on this. But it just it would be double that, triple that. So can I pop in here just one second, too? And I agree with everything you said. But I also think that even with a bifurcated trial, the amount of reasonable doubt goes, the amount of doubt it takes for reasonable doubt goes down whenever you have a death penalty case, because the possibility of death when these jurors are like actually, um, you know, deliberating, they're going to say, well, he could possibly get death. I need to really make sure that I have, you know, a lot of doubt. I mean, this has to be, a, a, you know, not a lot of doubt, a little bit of doubt. Sorry, I got that backwards. And, you know, anything I, I need to be really sure that he's guilty. So the amount of doubt that you need to convict in a death penalty case, in my opinion, is less than what you would need for just a regular trial. So in this case, with a circumstantial case with no weapons, no nothing, a, a jury might look at that and say, well, I don't have, you know, they don't have the guns. How can we even think about sending him to death row with 
no guns and weapons. But, I, you know, I agree that's probably a mistaken thought because it's a bifurcated trial and they can find guilty and not get the death penalty. But just the thought of that being out there, I think, would play in a juror's mind and it would have to play in the state's mind whenever they go to seek the death penalty. Uh, it's a comment from John Shepard. Uh, you think Alec will be domered, meaning killed in prison. And uh, the more I've talked to experts, uh, you know, some say he'd be protected because of his you know, family status, the amount of money he still has. Um, but I don't think uh, prison is a safe place for anyone, especially if you're, a, you know, a high value target. So he's definitely gonna have to dish out some dough to get protected in there. Irene Xavier writes, does anyone still believe he's innocent? And uh, the comments on my show last night were any indication. I would say there's a fair amount of people that still buy his innocence. He proclaimed his innocence. We'll get into all this as we continue to go on here. But I want to get back to Dr. Maranakis, who is uh, an expert in humans and a jury consultant. And uh, Craig Moyer, the juror who spoke to ABC News, says that when the panel first discussed this case just last night, Nine members voted guilty, two voted not guilty, and one was on the fence. And they've basically figured it out, he said, within 45 minutes. So, Dr. Maranakis, can you kind of illuminate what may have been going on in that room, even though you weren't there yourself? Because if two voted not guilty and they came back this quickly, how did the other, uh, you know, bunch of jurors convince them to do so so swiftly? Yeah, well, um, usually when they're in a case like this where there's a lot of evidence against a defendant, the people who vote not guilty are what we call contrarians. They're the type of people that are always playing devil's advocate, that are you know looking for the exception. There's Sometimes they're even the conspiracy theorist type people. And you can get a hung jury that way if you can get a, a strong contrarian on your jury. But most of the time they don't have anything really firm to argue. And it can be really intimidating in a room when you've got 10 other people that are screaming at you and who are very aggressive. And I see it all the time when we do mock juries, um, people can really get beat down quite quickly, especially if the other jurors are very strong and they say, prove it to me, prove it to me. And they get really aggressive. A lot of times those people just throw up their hands and they're not willing to go to bat for some guy who has basically admitted to lying to the police, lying, doing financial crimes, being a drug addict. People aren't going to fight that hard for somebody like that. Good point. Um, Firefly writes, Firefly 64, Dr. Christina doesn't look old enough to have that much experience. That's a compliment from a fellow female. Another female we have on the show often, Lonnie Coombs, does not look nearly uh, as old as she claims to be. Uh, she tweeted out today. She's not on the show, but I thought this was an interesting tweet. And uh, Brian, I'm going to toss this one to you. She tweets, I have never seen a sentencing judge give a defendant the opportunity to confess in such an intense and personal way. After commenting that Alec Murdoch's lies will never end, end, Judge Newman said to him, you will have to deal with that in your own soul. Was Judge Newman, it appeared that he was, giving him an opportunity to confess and was basically rebuffed by the now convicted killer? Well, Luke and I have tried probably... 10 or so jury trials in front of Judge Newman. He's a great jurist. But if there's ever a conviction, he, he really likes to have a cathartic moment with the defendant, whether they're willing to or not. And he will, he will try to, you know, moralize with them a little bit. He'll talk about how bad the situation is. We've had him even compliment our client on how well he did on the stand. Um, in a recent case we had, even when he was sentencing him on a murder case um, and talking about how intelligent he was. He, he's got his, he's a man of his own mind. He's got all of his own opinions. He's not afraid to express them. He is a, a little bit more of a unique judge in our state in terms of the dialogue that he often likes to try to have with defendants, whether it's at the end of a jury trial and it's a guilty or even in a, in a normal type plea. And Lori knows this, he'll He'll tell me, I mean, we always, we get our clients that if we're doing a guilty plea in front of Judge Newman, we kind of have a special conversation with them because he's not like other judges. He says, tell me what you did. <laughs> it's not, it's not just uh, you're pleading guilty because you're, you're here today with your lawyer. You've had enough time to review the evidence. He'll, he wants the lawyers to kind of step aside for a moment 
tell me what you did and why. I've also seen him um, on a guilty plea, really bat down victims in cases if he's not happy necessarily with what they're asking for or if they he finds them to be unreasonable in or or not credible in some regard so he is a fascinating wonderful judge in our state we're lucky to have him but for us all the south carolina lawyers that was very much expected moment um, but i think for the national and international audience hi finland um, that was probably very surprising uh, Elizabeth MC or Mac here writes, do you think the dismissed juror was the ace in the hole for the hung jury scenario? Um, Dr. Maranakis, I don't think we know that, but the question to you is, seems like it happened uh, nine months ago, but it was yesterday that uh, Judge Clifton Newman dismissed a juror because they were apparently speaking. How uh, surprised were you by that and how common is it? Uh, it's not that it's not common at all to have a juror um, either get dismissed this close to deliberations or to have a juror that's, that's speaking out um, and, and not following the rules of the court uh, or giving the judge a reason to dismiss them. But um, usually in those cases, those can be problem jurors. And if someone is willing to not follow the rules of the court, then that may be someone who's willing to hold out and hang a jury. But that it's all would be speculation. Can I ask, um, let me speak on that one, too, because I have from very good sources that that juror, what she was saying, which is why she was dismissed, was that she did not think the state had met her their burden. So she was definitely an ace in the hole for them. Wow. And that's why you saw the defense um, take exception. Not well, he said, I don't take exception. I just I don't know how he worded it. But he said, I don't take exception with your ruling. But he expressed his displeasure with the fact that this juror was Dick Harputley. I mean, that this juror was being dismissed. Did you want to follow up, Dr. Marinak? No, um, not exactly to that point, but something about the judge and the sentencing. I was curious, um, not knowing this judge myself, I sort of got the impression that the judge himself felt betrayed by the Murdoch family. Um, he, he mentioned about having the family members in court, that, that they've prosecuted people in court. I wondered how much of his sentencing, or at least what he was saying, was because he felt a little bit deceived or, um, or hurt that um, this family had been in that courtroom and wrapped their, their selves in justice and then now have unraveled like they have. Well, I think Brian and Luke were right in that Judge Newman does this in his sentencing. He also does it in bond hearings. If you bring a family of five, or a family of 10, every one of them is going to stand up and speak. So you'll be on your feet for a long time, even in a bond hearing. Uh, but I did feel just as you did that he felt personal about this. And I think that a lot, a lot of the attorneys in the state of South Carolina feel personal about this because he put a stain on all of us when he committed the financial crimes. The murder's not so much that's on him, but the financial crimes made us all look bad. Cello fan writes, and uh, Luke, this one's for you. Kennel video, constant lies, satellite data, and a jury that wasn't buying it. It goes beyond the character testimony. At the end of the day, um, the irony of all this is that the little detective, uh, Paul Murdoch, and that voice we just happened to capture that Alec did not know existed seemed to do him in. Um, is it your belief that digital forensics was ultimately his undoing? Well, it was definitely crucial, and that kennel video was the strongest piece of evidence for the state. Um, I'm sure I would have loved to have been in the room when they discovered that after examining Paul's phone and just kind of the eureka. But, um, you know, I just, I love to think about all of that, and then you take out all the financial crimes and self-admissions of, of being a chronic liar. And then if you have him testify, and he says, well, I just left them. <laughs> Yeah, it's a terribly tight timeline. It's like, well, who else would do it? But if you know he's not a consummate liar, if that is not in your purview as a juror, do you want to listen to him more? You don't know he's a liar. You just know he's crying. Who else could it be? But you're probably going to give more consideration to the evidence, not just that he's a bad guy who's probably lying to us. So it's it's a tough one for me, but I, I understand there's tons of people that are celebrating this. It's not for me to say whether he did it or not, but I just like to think about trials and due process and how I know how damaging it is when you get in 404B violations and just a mountain, an absolute mountain going 10 years back of bad crimes, wrongs, acts. Then you get into 
particularly prejudicial evidence about the roadside shooting when you go to a, a suicide attempt. I mean, there's case law on that, that it's just so prejudicial to to know that someone tried to kill themselves because they feel so guilty. So if you take all that out, <clears throat> I'd be very curious in terms of an experiment to know what a jury might do. I think they certainly would have deliberated a lot longer. Hard to say what the end result would be. Uh, I'm an absolute massive dog lover. Luca writes, what happened to the dogs? Where are they now? I feel bad. I didn't even think about that. Uh, shout out to Baby Doll who says Buster may have Brody. And someone else said that Blanca, the housekeeper, may have Bubba. Um, but I'd be curious to know the answer to that question. Uh, on to uh, Jana Hertzberg. I think it came down to him lying about being there during the time of the murder and a family gun was used and he lied about it. Alec Murdoch is a master manipulator. I think the jurors all saw through Alec Murdoch, Dr. Maranakis. Um, I think people have a tendency um, in the court of public opinion to undermine jurors, but they're all of us and they're pretty smart, right? And it looks like they saw through all the proverbial BS in this case. Jurors really do want to do the right thing. Um, they take an oath and they take that oath seriously. So... I, I have no reason to doubt these jurors didn't give it their all, but you know, one lie you can look past two lies, maybe, but a lie on top of lie on top of lie. Um, then people are just feel like they are being taken advantage of by the liar too. And I, I think that's ultimately what did him in is, is, as you said, not just the one lie about the alibi, but when you put that in the context of so many jurors didn't want to be the next people who were lied to. Uh, Tilo, friend of the show from Boston, she claims to have a heavy Boston accent. Harputlian talked as if the financial stuff coming in was the reason he was found guilty. It was the kennel video and him himself is the reason they found him guilty. He's phony and the jury knew it. Um, Luke, to you, is Harputlian, I mean, he's a smart guy, obviously. Is he angling from some sort of legal perspective by saying this or does he truly believe that? He is a smart guy. He's very experienced and he probably believes that it is a, an appellate issue. So, you know, part of it is this is why we lost because of this violation of the rules of evidence. Um, he might believe it. I know when I get in deep in a trial, I get my trial blinders on and I can believe almost anything, but I, um, I don't know if, if the, if Tilo is saying that he being Alec Murdoch is a phony or Harputlian, I assume she's referring to Harputlian or yeah. Mur Murdoch. Mur Murdoch, uh, I think. No, but, um, you know, Harputlian's been called a lot of things. I don't me think he's been called a phony. <laughs> but, um, you know, he's having a press conference and he's stating his intention. Part of it is probably to, you know, have a press conference and he, he's unhappy with the ruling. And I understand that, but it is what it is. I would, you know, I'm just still baffled why they didn't actually have more anything to say at sentencing. Um, but that's just me. Truth Myers writes, Buster collapsed outside of court. I have been working on this show and the other show all day. I've not heard of this. Um, be curious to know if any of you did, Lori, did you hear about this? No, I'd be curious to know more about this. Uh, if it was in fact the case, I do know about this from Kelly Shostell. All these South Carolinians are spitfires. I love it. Um, one of the very few silver linings in all this is I got to meet some really great people from the Palmetto State, the great state of South Carolina, and uh, it really shined a, a, a beautiful light on all the people there um, working hard and uh, keeping it together and uh, all being addicted to this trial as we went through it together. Um, I want to read to you guys this um, exchange between Judge Clifton Newman and Alec Murdoch. Um, Alec Murdoch, not once, but twice today, uh, declared his innocence again. And he says, and I quote Alec Murdoch here, and I'd love to get all you guys uh, to, to kind of kick it back and tell me what you think. I would never under any circumstances hurt my wife, Maggie, and I would never under any circumstances hurt my son, Paw Paw, he said. Judge Clifton Newman responded, it might not have been you. It might have been the monster you become when you take 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 opioid pills. Maybe you become another person. I've seen that before. 
the person standing before me was not the person who committed the crime, though it is the same individual. That really um, made me sit up in my seat. Lori, um, how did you react to hearing those powerful words? Yeah, I, I when it, when he first started, I was like, maybe he's going to say it was somebody else with you then. But you were also there because that's how I felt the whole time. Maybe it was somebody else. I don't think Creighton Waters put a gun in Alec Murdoch's hand. Uh, yes, he was there, but I, there could have been somebody else. Even the state's expert admitted that there was the possibility there were two shooters. So when he said that, I thought he was going that way and he completely pivoted and did it another way. But he's right. People who are addicted to drugs have a lot of problems, mental problems. I was, it wasn't my case, but I was in court uh, a couple of weeks ago and saw a woman who was on meth that put an ax in her friend's head. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that happens when you are on drugs, but we heard him three seconds before her three minutes before, you know, sounding like a regular dude talking about Bubba. And she, by the way, Bubba is with the housekeeper. Um, I don't know about the other ones, but Bubba is with Blanca. But, um, you know, we, we heard him on that, that tape and he sounded perfectly fine, like nothing was wrong. And so, you know, Judge Newman was giving him an out, trying again to get him to admit it in some way, shape or form. And he wasn't having it. Uh, Dr. Maranak, I'm sorry, Dr. Maranak, what did you think? Yeah, you know, the state of South Carolina is one of the states that really has been decimated by the opioid pandemic. And I have no doubt that Judge Newman has seen many defendants before him that have struggled with addiction and, and those issues. So I'm sure, and, and maybe he has someone close to them him, that has struggled with those issues. But um, to see that good people doing bad things uh, it probably resonated with him um, from what he's seen in the past and other defendants and other people. So I, I wasn't surprised the judge might go that direction, given that he felt like the family was a good family, at least at, at one point in time. And, and Alec had some good in him at one point in time. Uh, Jen, uh, yeah. I'll just have you mute there. There you go. I love watching Lori every evening on TikTok for her take. Thank you, Lori. A lot of South Carolina attorneys built up a big fan base during this uh, whole trial, and uh, I'm sure they're going to keep it up as well. And it's not just uh, Scotland and Ireland. We've got uh, Lisbon, Portugal here. Hi, Maria Resende. Um, Eric Bland tweeted something out, Brian. He says, after Alec took the stand, we discussed that the trial became a referendum against Alec and that the science and technology debates went out the window the jury proclaimed loudly that Alec was going to be able to pull off, was not going to be able to pull off one last con job. Um, the obvious question to you, Brian, was AM taking the stand a fatal error by Dick Harputley? And even though he really couldn't prevent it, if it's something that Alec wanted to do. Well, I think they had no choice. Luke and I believe that he was always going to have to take a stand. I mean, as soon as, the financial crimes came in and the jury knew him as a, as Creighton Water said, an, an easy and convincing liar. And the kennel video, which was the, the real uh, nail in the coffin for him, he had to get there and do something. If he pled the fifth or if he just, you know, didn't take, you know, did decide not to testify um, and they're going to lose last closing because they introduced evidence in this case. So he had to testify. Now it's, he had to get up there and, and do kind of what he did. I mean, by the financial crimes coming in, like Lori said, it, it makes the financial crimes all a plea deal. So that, you know, thinking about the appellate issue as well, um, with the financial crimes coming in, not only does it um, cause him to have to take the stand, have to address those issues, he also has to confess to things that he's otherwise presumed innocent on. Um, so, you know, I just, he talked way too much. He talked too much from day one. He talked too much with his lawyers in the car. He talked too much from rehab with his lawyers. Um, I mean, it, it was just a lot of talking in this case. Um, you say general rule of thumb, at least in our practice, is you do your talking at the end um, in front of a jury. You don't you don't continue to conduct yourself in a way where you're having interviews, especially with your lawyers present. So there's a lot of problems with that aspect of it all. But to, to Eric Bland, I mean, he's right up the street from us and he's been banging the drum for a long time, rightfully so, for you know, advocating for you know his client. 
Um, and he, you know, he thinks Alex is, you know, you know what? So no, no problems with, no problems with his analysis, but without the financials, he, uh, coming in, Alec Murdoch may have had a chance of having the jury find him credible. So, you know, to the extent they didn't, um, it's probably more than him just blowing snot. It has a lot to do with everything else they heard in this case about what an easy and convincing liar he is. And uh, Luke, to you, um, seems like 100 years ago, but Jim Griffin just uh, delivered those closing uh, arguments and everyone seemed to agree that he seemed off. What do you think was going on? I mean, he's a very capable attorney. Do you think he was just, um, I don't know, giving in at that point, um, not believing that his client was innocent? Something did not seem right. I think Jim personally truly believes he's innocent and has this deep connection to the Murdoch family, given his representation of Paul and the criminal charge relating to the book case. But um, Jim is a super cerebral lawyer, vastly successful lawyer, but he's, he does a lot of, you know, white collar financial crimes. And I don't think he, I mean, a state level double murder charge is like a knife fight in a phone book. I mean, it, it, to, to win the day in the closing, it's going to take Clarence Darrow esque closing argument to just super persuade somebody. Um, and that's, I don't think that's what he's known for. And so that's just, he did a good job as Jim Griffin does, but he's not going to just cap captivate a jury and make them go, Oh, wow. I didn't think about it until right now. I mean, someone would have to really empower that jury to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, put aside the financial crimes and just think about the evidence of the murder, just the murder. Um, so it's, he did a Jim Griffin closing and I think he, he's a great lawyer but I don't think it may be the first murder case he's ever done. I don't know. Certainly as a probably a defense lawyer. But um, so that's just my critique. It, it He apologized a lot. He had some screw ups. His phone went off. I mean, he it was very conversational, but it wasn't all inspiring. Teresa writes, and this my father is in his 90th year of life right now. And he always he's a retired psychiatrist and uh his favorite slogan as a therapist, a highly trained therapist, is Nike slogan. He says, just do it. You feel a fear, just do it. He always says, just do it. But one of the other things he always told me and still tells me is life turns on a dime. And Teresa's comment reminds me of that. The Murdoch dynasty is now a murderer of a Murdoch. Um, for 100 years, this was the most powerful, influential family uh, in that part of South Carolina. And it seems like in an instant, all that changes. Now they will forever be remembered this way. Um, Lori, to you, Judge Clifton Newman said, and I'll quote again here, you've practiced law before me and we've seen each other at various occasions throughout the years. And that was especially heartbreaking for me to see you go in the media from being a grieving father who lost a wife and a son to being the person indicted and convicted of killing them. I mean, just judge Clifton Newman is such a benign looking guy, but he throws these like verbal daggers in a very subtle kind of way. Uh, my question to you about this though, is what about this personal relationship between the judge and defendant and now a convicted killer? Well, first of all, can I just address the last two things? One, I wanted to say that um, Dick Harputlin did a good job with this 403 bad character evidence. When he did the objection, he said that Alec Murdoch would not have testified had it not been for that evidence coming in. So that sets up a good grounds for the appeal. Um, and there was something else I was going to talk about with it. Um, We're were, all tired. I'm, I'm hanging on by a thread right now. Don't worry. No, I can't. Like My mind is going. Uh, but with Knowing, knowing Alec Murdoch, I don't know that they were good friends. They ran in the same circles, just like a lot of us did. So a lot of us are really surprised. I think the people that we really have to look at that were the most upset in this case were his law partners, uh, and his, you know, probably especially Randy Randolph, his brother, um, because that's his legacy too. That law firm that has been there for a century has it, that was his legacy and in one fell swoop Ellen Murdoch ripped that all apart and not only that they had all these millions of dollars that they have to pay back personally so uh, Judge Newman does have that relationship it would be the same as if I was to you know go and ask somebody but 
Um, and I've known Judge Newman. He was friends with my dad. He, I did my first deposition in private practice against Judge Newman when he was in private practice. So I've known him forever. And he just, I think he looks for that connection. Uh, we used to have Judge Manning on the bench. Y'all remember Judge Manning, Sheely's. Um, and all, you know, he'd say, who are your people? Where are you from? And he just, I'll try to get to know who that person was. And Judge Newman, he knows you, but he, without asking the questions, he just knows you. And the, I think this sentence with the, them running it consecutively, 30 years, let's be honest, 30 years is a life sentence for Alec Murdoch. It's effectively a life sentence. So instead of doing that, he gave him a life sentence, which I predicted he would last night. Um, but I didn't predict that he would do it consecutively. So this, that especially shows anger on the part of Judge Newman. And really and truly, you've got nobody speaking on either side. Nobody's speaking for Maggie's family. Nobody's speaking from his family. So nobody's asking for two consecutive life sentences and he gave it to him anyway. That's because that's how he felt. That's how betrayed he felt and, and how heinous he thought this crime was and how big the lies that were told, how bad those lies were and what a betrayal that was to the legal community, to his friends and to his family. That was a personal ruling on his part. I think that's a really interesting uh, distinction and a point there. So he uh, on his own decided to do, uh, the consecutive sentence as yeah. opposed to concurrent. Um, so, Clinton Waters asked for it, but yeah. no one, there was no one there to say anything different. So if, if you're the winning side and you asked for it, and I didn't realize that he asked for it, but um, but even so, we normally run cases concurrent here in South Carolina. You really, I mean, it has to be something really big to get the consecutive ruling in there. But I guess you know, if you're saying that he asked for it, which I I missed that part. Um, and then Dick doesn't say anything back and Jim doesn't say anything back. What are you going to do? And that was the other point. I was, that was what I was trying to think of before when you were talking about the closing argument of Jim Griffin. It sounded to me like a closing argument that somebody else wrote and he wasn't familiar enough with. He really stumbled and fumbled through it, even reading the last part of it. And the, that was the part he got all emotional in. So uh, it was that was a fumbling um, run on sentence of a closing argument. By the way, something someone said to me kind of stuck in my mind, and it is subtle. By the way, thanks, CC. Thumbs up, guys. Please uh, like the show. I appreciate that. Um, when he proclaimed his innocence today, he, he did exactly that. He said, I'm innocent, but neither time could he bring himself to say, I didn't murder. I, I didn't kill. Um, I believe he just said, I'm innocent. I could be wrong about that, but someone pointed that out. I thought that was uh, somewhat interesting. Someone else asked earlier does anyone believe he is still innocent truth myers writes this case has so much reasonable doubt jury got it wrong that's not to say necessarily that truth thinks he's innocent but there was too much reasonable doubt so there are going to be people who definitely have an issue um with this verdict one way or the other uh dr maranakis another comment from judge clifton newman and this one uh gave me uh, goosebumps and it says, I know you have to see Paul and Maggie during the night when you are attempting to go to sleep. I'm sure they come and visit you. That's really haunting. Um, if this man truly is a sociopath, maybe he doesn't worry about it, but what did you make of that comment? It, again, it goes back to how personal this is, I think for judge Newman and not just because he's part of the legal community, but the murder of your own child is one of the most heinous crimes you can think of. And, and it, so it really is upsetting for any parent to even think about that. And I could see you know, someone who feels that strongly about it, thinking, especially if it's someone, a man of faith, thinking about those things and, and trying to get Alec Murdoch to admit, I think he really was trying to get him to confess in his statement there for, before sentencing. I think he said something like that, like, this is your chance to make amends, to get peace for your family. And I think he wanted that closure himself, the judge did, and he didn't get it. Um, Elizabeth C. writes, Buster uh, Murdoch down outside the court was inconsolable they had to help get him in the car. I'm sure there's going to be video of that flying around. I just have not seen it yet. Followed again by Buster broke down. Um, Jerry got it wrong. I'm, I'm flying through some comments here. Um, 
Here's a comment. I don't want to beat up on him, but back to you, uh, Brian, just in terms of how all this is going to progress forward. Suzanne Roberge writes, when will Buster be charged with knowingly giving his ID to Paul, which resulted in the death of Mallory Beach due to Paul's drunk driving? So again, I mean, much of this is not yet settled. Um, how do you think it all moves forward from here in light of the fact that uh, the the now the patriarch is behind bars. <clears throat> well, on that civil case, it's interesting. I mean, let's say he was out and about. Let's say it was a hung jury and they're going to try this again in four or five months. Potentially, he has the ability to, you know, earn an income through various mechanisms. I mean, he's not going to be able to make any money off this scenario in SCDC, South Carolina Department of Corrections. Um. So, you know, I, I don't know about Buster getting charged criminally with like a fake ID type charge. I mean, that's a 30 day misdemeanor in South Carolina, I think. I mean, that's I don't I, you know, he may be tied up in the civil liability aspect of, of that, um, as was Alec Murdoch for negligently supervising his his son at the time. You know, that, but, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, the, the reverberations of a case like this in South Carolina, I mean, there's a lot of um, victory lapping yesterday and today by the prosecution, rightly so. But we also heard from SLED's uh, chief, Mark Keel, um, mm -hmm. making a public kind of announcement that anyone who has assisted Alec Murdoch in any crime, we're still coming for you, even if we haven't brought a charge yet. So that was a little puffing up, um, I believe that was probably halfway in response to the scrutiny that SLED received throughout the six week trial for some of the things they didn't do correctly. I mean, objectively, they didn't do some things very well. Um, it's been covered, I'm sure, in your show. But um, I mean, agents misleading the state grand jury, lying for the state grand jury, evidence improperly seized where you can't determine uh gps data off a victim's cell phone i mean we could go on and on so like i think mark keel getting up you know there may be some vengeance coming from the top agency in in the state law enforcement agency for anything associated with the murdoch family so we'll see but i like Lori said earlier i don't as tragic as uh, mr smith's death is i don't i don't see anything landing on buster at this point um as much social media uh, discussion on that topic, but um, I don't think he's gonna get charged criminally for uh, letting his brother um, use his ID. He may be civilly held accountable though. And Luke, do you think the uh, sled bashing was fair? Uh, Mr. Keel, your brother just alluded to him. He got up. I thought it was really interesting. The head of such a big uh, law enforcement agency he said he's only given two press conferences in his 12 years running sled um, saying that he is going to go after uh, anyone else uh, who's involved, but the bashing of sled justified or not. Sure. I mean, <laughs> I know this, this trial was, you know, microscope six ways from Sunday, but every trial, especially a murder trial, law enforcement is always heavily scrutinized. We as defense lawyers have to do it. If they made a huge mistake or even little mistakes here, there are some pretty big mistakes and it's just part of I mean, defense lawyers are allowed to attack the integrity of an investigation. That's just part of it. And so here, because it was so high profile, they didn't cover themselves in glory. There were some mistakes. So it made, it was embarrassing, I guess. And then they wanted to take their, their time in the sun to look official and say, we did a great job and, and any other bad guys were coming after you. So it's just all part of the process of a, of a trial. Law enforcement always scrutinize, and sometimes there's very little to say to law enforcement if they do a really good job. But and, um, this was not the case. <laughs> and Lori Murray, do you think that anything will change with SLED as a result of this case, or is it just, uh, you know, just for show right now? Well, I can tell you one thing that'll change, and that's that Agent Owen will never testify again. He's done. <laughs> He's burned. I mean, he lied to the grand jury. It doesn't get much worse than that. He admitted on the stand that he lied. So he's never going to testify. And, you know, this is one of the things that was so frustrating for me watching Dick or Jim Griffin's closing argument. First of all, I don't think he ever said in his closing argument that Ella didn't kill Maggie and Paul. <clears throat> I'd have to go back and watch that entire boring thing. 
but I don't, and I don't know if I can do that. But the first thing he should have done, <clears throat> excuse me, is stand up and say, he's a liar. He's a cheater. He's a thief, but he is not a murderer. Alec Murdoch did not kill his wife and child. He didn't do it. And then he should have moved on from there. I also thought that a really good point would have been to say, you know, the state wants you to believe that he's a liar and that he got so caught up in these lies that there was so much pressure coming down on him that it caused him to kill his wife and child. Well, Agent Owens got up there and lied on the stand and lied to the grand jury and will never work again. Have we checked on his family? I mean, it just there were a lot of things that, that they could have done with that. So, yeah, there needs to be some changes at SLED because – they look bad. That's why Mark Hills is not going to show up if they look good. They looked bad and there should be some changes. And honestly, I think it should start with him. Just my opinion. Well, um, speak South Carolina spitfire right there. I love it. Sorry. Um, Melissa writes, hello, y'all listening in while I'm vacation in Vegas. Great panel. Joel, thank you so much. I picked that comment because I'm a diehard fight fan, huge fight, heavyweight fight. Uh, UFC fight in Vegas tomorrow night. Melissa, if you're going, don't tell me because I'll be upset because I want to go. Um, Linda writes, Joel, I agree with you. Buster came around to thinking that his father did kill his mother and brother. I don't know. That was uh, what a lot of people were intimating and maybe the reason he's having such trouble according to these reports right now that he collapsed. I mean, that is a lot to deal with for a young man. Um to you, Dr. Maranakis, back to this interview, I thought this was really interesting. First of all, how quickly ABC News got a juror to speak. And I used to work in broadcast news, and I know exactly how this works. They send uh, an army down there, and they start buttering up these people. And the minute they're let go, um, they grab them. And that's what happened here. But that's the job of the media. Um, but the reporter said and I'd like to give her a shout out. I believe it was Eva Pilgrim or Ava Pilgrim. Uh, she said, for some people, it is so hard to understand how a husband, especially a father, would kill their own son. What made you so sure that he had? And then the juror responded by saying his responses, how quick he was with defense and his lies, his steady lies. Did you feel like he was a liar? She asked a good liar, but not good enough. Your thoughts. Yeah, clearly this juror um, wanted it, uh, his chance to talk about this. And you, anytime you have a group of 12 people, there's going to be some there that, that wants their, their fame uh, about it. And I'm not saying that it wasn't right for this juror to speak out. Certainly had every right to do so. But um, I think this juror wanted to, to let everybody know that he wasn't going to get fooled by this and that he was smarter than all the people that have, that have been fooled all these years. And I think he kind of wanted to assert his authority over Alec Murdoch. And that's, that's not really uncommon when you've got a high profile defendant. I've done lots of high profile cases and the jurors want to make a statement that they, they feel that they are smarter than better than whatever, than someone who was previously re re viewed as someone who was high and well-respected in the community. Um, this comment here from H Doubtbacker. Um, Lori, to you, nine guilty. We went over this with Dr. Marina Marinakis, but now I'd like to get the lawyer's take. Nine guilty, two not guilty, one undecided. They worked it out in one hour. Thank you, jurors. Um, Lori, I don't know. I guess the broader question is, do you know what a jury's thinking uh, once you're in front of them? Do you get a sense? Um, no. Do you think? <laughs> I mean, I think the Sheelys will tell you too what goes on in that that jury room. It can be the most random of things that they pick up on. You have no clue what they're thinking in that jury room. Uh, so, again, that, but the the thing for me with with that that count there is that those three gave in real easy to only be in there for three hours, and I think that's kind of a shame. They should have at least looked at the evidence again instead of just having nine people go, "He did it. He did it. He did it. He lied. He lied. He lied." Um, you know, I would have at least taken a little bit more time if I was the holdout. But, you know, I'm kind of stubborn. They clearly were not. Uh, Luke, to you, um, same question. Can you start to read a jury or is that something you don't even try to do because, you know, it's it's in, it's in vain, ultimately? It's kind of like reading tea leaves. I don't know. I mean, when you're up there, you're giving a closing argument and you're looking these people in the eye. I mean, you know, I, 
I want to like look more at the person that at least seems interested. And some people are just like stone faced and then I might get a not guilty. And so, you, so you don't understand half the time body reaction, all that is in the South Carolina. Unfortunately, we know so very little about a jury unless it's a death penalty case or unless you get some special unusual voir dire. Cause we just, we don't have real voir dire. It's, it sucks. It's a statute. We're not really allowed to get to know our jury, so we're kind of flying blind half the time. It's a shame. Um, th this this question, by the way, Aaron Dene writes, I love Lori. Lori's got uh, a lot of fans on here. Um, Pretty Lies and Alibis, a great podcast. Gigi McKelvey, who was reporting for uh, Law and Crime, she was on this podcast a bunch of times, uh, and I consider her a friend now. She tweeted out, um, she tweeted the following. The family came expecting to hear proof Alec killed Maggie and Paul. They did not hear that evidence. They are convinced now more than ever he did not do it. Uh, Dr. Maranakis, uh, we talked about this a little, but does it surprise you? Um, Gigi's an excellent reporter, um, and, you know, trust, I, I trust uh, what, what she is saying here, but do you buy that? I certainly think it's very possible. I mean, these family members have known him for their entire lives or for a large part of their lives. Many of these people are likely to believe that he is innocent, um, especially if they have a loving relationship with him. And it's it's really hard to think that somebody that you love and care and have respected all your life did something like this. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if those people would defend him. Uh, but as for the jury issue, I, it's funny, when I do jury selections in South Carolina, I almost exclusively rely on the juror's social media and looking up jurors' uh, Facebook accounts, LinkedIn accounts, everything they're posting on blogs, that's usually how we're able to predict how jurors are able to are, are likely to vote in South Carolina. And then these jurors that are speaking out to the public, I, you know, I don't know if they realize this, but the things they say in public now could be used uh, by the defense team for appellate issues. So if these jurors are saying things like lies, lies, uh, all that, that mattered to me were all the lies and the financial issues, that's going to give the defense some uh, ammunition to argue how influential it was on the verdict. Courtney Dudley comments here, when the case is all circumstantial, Luke, this is your wheelhouse. It's risky for the prosecutor to seek the death penalty. It could result in a not guilty. People need to be sure when it comes to the death penalty. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I agree. I mean, there most prosecutors aren't going to elect to seek the death penalty, which is so expensive to prosecute on a circumstantial case. I mean, the ones that actually go forward are like slam dunks. Um, you know, the one I had in Aiken several years ago, my client's on video shooting a police officer. So there you go. It wasn't a question of who did it. So you don't see very many circumstantial death penalty cases. And again, I think um, the demographic of who Mr. Murdoch is, is one of the reasons why they would never consider it in South Carolina. And they're not going to do it on a circumstantial case. And Joel, unfortunately, this is going to have to be our last, our last response here. We got to move some stuff around here and get ready for the live news here that, you know, Lori's been doing this as well <laughs> in the same studio. So we really appreciate being on and this has been a great panel. The uh, Sheely twins are awesome. Thank you both for coming on Luke and Brian Sheely, obviously uh, upstanding gentlemen and very fine criminal defense attorneys. Thanks so much. We will speak again. Thank you. And we'll take a couple more comments and we're going to wrap this show up, but thanks guys. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Moving along here, um, seemed to me from Kathy Prosser that Judge Newman would very comfortably have sentenced Alec Murdoch to death, but it wasn't an option here. He felt uh, more remorse for Maggie and Paul than Alec Murdoch demonstrated. Uh, do you believe that, Lori? Do you think that given the chance um, because of, you know, Dr. Marinas Marinakis describing the personal nature of this, seemingly personal, do you think he would have sentenced him to death? If it was on the table, 100 percent. Yeah, I do. Um, it's I, I watched that same sentencing and, you know, I, I was doing a newscast at the time, so I'm trying to watch it and do this at the same time. Uh, so I went back and watched it. And just when I went back, everybody had already seen it by that time. And I'm sitting there going, oh, wait, what? I couldn't believe that the, the words that he said, they were so personal and so strong. And, and he's known for that. He really is known for that. Uh but in a case that's this high profile, I guess he wanted 
you know, he did the Uber case too, and he did the same thing in the Uber case. And this one was just different because it was so high profile and it was somebody that we all, um, and when I say we all, I mean, we all white lawyers that are in the state of South Carolina can relate to. Um, there are a lot of people that can't relate to Alec Murdoch, but there are a lot of people that can. So I think that it was, it was very strong language and very personal to him. And then Danielle Simone writes, Luke is speaking facts, hence why Judge Newman made the comment about others getting the death penalty uh, over lesser conduct. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a sad cliche, but life is not fair. Much broader um, kind of spectrum here uh, to you, Dr. Maranakis, and we'll start to wind things up here because I think everyone is completely fried at this point on a Friday. But I'm curious, why such an incredible interest in this case. I mean, just on this tiny little show here that's growing, uh, we've got people from Ireland, Scotland, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Africa, um, Arizona, South Carolina, New Jersey, and the list goes on. Why such a insatiable appetite uh, for this story and true crime, in your opinion? You know, at the risk, I, I, I don't want to offend any of one of your, your listeners here, but um, we Please don't. <laughs> regular people like to see the rich fall um, and to see them show their true colors, because so often are people of color and people of low socioeconomic status been the ones that go, have gone to prison, are the ones that are, you know, are scrutinized in the media that are, are shown as being bad people. And to now see a rich white man show that these people too can be bad people and have their vices, I think makes the little guy feel a little bit like justice is starting to be served. There's, um, There's uh, where did this where comment, did this comment? Here? Uh, See, I'm gonna be a mute back up because we're getting an echo, but uh, I just saw a comment from someone who says they're a prison nurse. Whoever that is, I would love for you to email me, uh, survivingthesurvivor at gmail.com. And tell me how you think Alec Murdoch will be treated uh, in the big house. I'm, I'm curious to see what you have to say. Lori, same question to you. Um, you're a South Carolinian there. Um, why do you think there was such a spotlight on this case for so many weeks? Well, can I, I want to address that, the question about how it would be treated too. And then I would love to know, you can tell me later how it, um, how I differ from her. <laughs> sure. Um, but the one thing is, first of all, he's going to a maximum security prison. He'll probably go to Lee Correctional Institute, uh, which is, that's the one, if you hear about a riot in South Carolina, that is the prison that the riot is at. There was a major one not uh, a couple of years ago. Many people died. Um, but Ellen Murdoch has a marketable skill, and that is the fact that he is a lawyer. So he will be able to write all those PCRs and all of their legal proceedings, their appellate work when they were doing per se because they can't afford a lawyer. Alec Murdoch has that marketable skill. So I don't think he'll be treated horribly when he gets in there. I mean, everybody in there has been convicted of a violent crime. Yes, his is extremely violent, but um, I, th I think he'll have a marketable skill that he can use to help him when he gets in there. And I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> uh, why do you think such a big spotlight shine down on this trial? I think it was because there was just so much. I mean, you had one family with five deaths and every time you turned around, it was something new, something else to add and pile on top of that. I started doing this case or covering this case when the murders happened and I'm a friend of Ronnie Crosby's and Ronnie Crosby sent me a message. I mean, the first video I did blew up. So I did another video right after. I remember saying, who knew y'all were so interested in the Murdochs? I remember starting it like that. And then I got a call or text from Ronnie Crosby said, you hurt my feelings. That's one of my good friends. This is before he knew the extent of what Alec had done. Um, so I went back and I said, you know, it's never my intention to hurt anybody's feelings, especially not a friend of mine's. So I'm going to I'm going to take a step back. I'm still following the case, but I'm going to take a step back from posting about it because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. That's not my intent on here. And they were all like, oh, they got you. They got to you. That's how powerful they think that this family is, that they would get to somebody like me who's just, you know, making, and I didn't have nearly the followers back then that I have now. So they, you had all of that. You had five bodies surrounding one family. You had uh, this, I agree with her that there was this big dynasty and they're, you know, like to see the rich fall. Um, 
but it was just so much. There was some, you know, every time there was another death and you're like, well, what did he do in this one? And it just was intriguing. Like every, there's, and I, there was a local podcaster. I'm not going to use her name because I don't really like her, but there was a local podcaster and she, um, she kept putting some things out that, you know, kept interest sparked in this case. And every time something new would come out, um, you know, we'd all get right back into it and just kind of fan the flames again, just never went out. There was always something new, just when you thought it was the gift that keeps on giving. I'll just say that and shut up. Bomb threat, witness tampering, uh, COVID, uh, you name it, this trial had it. Um, this comment here kind of hits home in a weird way for me, spending 20, almost seven years as a broadcast news guy. Linda T. writes, this case will go away in the news and the families will remain in pain. This is something I always struggle with because uh, as a former reporter, we would swoop into places like the church shooting in Charleston. I covered that. Um, I covered a few hurricanes in Charleston um, and I covered riots in North Carolina. You go in, you go out. Um, but this for an eternity um, will be with Buster for not an attorney, the remainder of his life. And uh, it's just a sad reality um, and something that we all have to deal with. Um, Dr. Christina Maranakis, she has over 20 years of jury research study, uh, jur jury research study in applied practice in law and psychology. Uh, and she is a jury consultant. She's based out of LA. But more than that, she's a good person who understands human behavior any final thoughts on this, uh, what feels like a hangover of a day after the verdict? Yeah, I think Linda T uh, really gave a, the perfect comment to close it out on because um, we were talking about real people's lives and as entertaining as it was to follow this for all these weeks, um, these are real people um, and they will have to live with what happens uh, to their families and um, the Murdochs and, and even everyone else that was involved, the jurors, the lawyers. This is going to be one of the most memorable cases in their career. And so I just hope that people give a little grace to one another. And, you know, while we follow these cases, just showing respect to all the parties are, who are involved as they are real people. Very well said. Uh, Lori Murray. Wish I met her before uh, the very, very uh, end of this whole thing, but we'll, we'll have her back on to discuss other cases. She has an office in Columbia, South Carolina that bears her name. As you can tell, she's an aggressive litigator, negotiator. Her focus is on criminal defense and personal injury matters. Uh, your final thoughts on this bizarre evening where a uh, once prominent South Carolina attorney is now a convicted killer of his wife and son. Well, I think that uh, you hit the nail on the head. It is just, um, it's just going to be sad for this entire family. And, you know, Judge Newman actually lost a child. Uh, his son died probably a week, maybe two weeks before he started this trial. His daughter is also a judge in Columbia. So they were on the bench, you know, side by side almost and in courtroom side by side. But his son was like 40 years old. I think he was actually 40 years old and died of a, an embolism or something like that, pulmonary embolism. So a very sudden death. And I think that's one of the reasons why this was so personal to him. But I did send both of them a card. As you know, I told you I've, I've been on them for years. So I, I sent both of them a card and I said, I, the, he's in the middle of this trial. This is why this was going on. And I said, I purposefully waited to send you this card because I know that after, because my, my dad passed away and I remember, I know that after the, the service and the people are gone, that you feel like the world has moved on and you are still spinning. You're still going and the world has moved on. And that's going to be how it is for this family. The world is going to move on from them and they're still going to be spinning. And it is, it's a grief process. They're going to have to grieve this trial, the grief, the loss all over again. And now they're going to have to grieve the loss of, of Ellen. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank Dr. Maranakis, Lori Murray, of course, Luke and Brian Sheely, all fine attorneys and a fine jury consultant. Uh, I want to thank Linda T. This comment, I think I'm getting emotional here at the end of a long trial. She says, thank you, surviving the survivor. God bless you. Let's all be kind to each other. This world can be brutal, so let's all be nice. I, I'll be nice to my mom. People say I'm too hard on her. Sunday night, we're hosting a show, 7 p.m. Eastern time. This is a wild story. Uh, a young woman named 
Ellen Greenberg was stabbed 20 times back in 2011, 10 on her back and neck, the back of her neck, two after her heart stopped beating, and it was ruled a suicide. Um, we have her mother and father on the show. Uh, it's a pretty high profile case. We're hoping to get some justice for the family. Something doesn't smell right there. So please join us uh, on Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time. And I was just looking for this final uh, baby doll said, love you. I love you back. Lisa for broken heart. It's a sad night, but uh, justice was served. Appreciate you all. Love you, America.